All right, good evening. Today is Tuesday, October 11th, and a meeting of the Salem-Kaiser School Board is called to order. This is a regular business session. Um, I will take attendance now. Um, we have our two student advisors in attendance, Director Inojos Pressi, myself, Director Guzman Ortiz, and Director Sean Jagiri in the room. I know Director Avila is going to be late this evening, and Director Hyen is on Zoom. So um, with that, I will move forward to do um, our new land acknowledgement. Um, we've worked hard on this land acknowledgement, um, reached out to um, the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde and Siletz, um, and we really appreciate the partnership, the government-to-government -government relationship with those tribes. And this is the first time we are going to do um, our, our new land acknowledgement. We're gathered today on the land of the Kalapuya, who are represented by the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. The relationship between the Kalapuya people and this land continues unbroken to this day. And we offer gratitude for the land and for the generations present and past who have stewarded the land since time immemorial. We respectfully acknowledge and honor past, present, and future Native American and indigenous students and staff of Salem-Kaiser Public Schools. We invite you to join us in honoring these ancestral grounds and celebrating the resilience and strength of all Native American and indigenous people. And now, um, if you would join me in doing the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We do have one agenda modification this evening, which will be handled under action items, item 5C. This item will be to declare a board position vacancy upon the resignation of Director Danielle Bethel, which board leadership received yesterday, October 10th. I'd personally like to acknowledge Director Bethel and thank her for her dedication and service to Salem-Kaiser Public Schools. At this point, um, we will move on to the rest of our full agenda but we will discuss more about the vacancy and next steps when we get to action item 5C. With that, um, I would like to move on to spotlights and hand it over to Superintendent Perry. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, our first spotlight is going to be uh, presented by Tara Romine, our principal at uh, South Salem High School. Tara, good evening, and we're excited to have you here tonight. Good evening, um, Chairperson, uh, Chair Carson Cottingham, board members, and Superintendent Perry. Um, I would like to take the next few minutes to introduce you to South Salem High School teacher Tanya Longman. Tanya, are you on the call? Yes, I am. Awesome. Sorry, I was <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, Tanya is being recognized as the Confederation in Oregon for Language Teaching Cofalt Teacher of the Year. Tanya has exceeded the requirements for this award in so many ways. She has dedicated 23 years at South Salem High School where she has taught German and French. She is the German program at South Salem High School. Tanya has mentored several teachers in the field. And in addition, she prepares her students for rigorous exams such as the National German exam and the IB German exam. Because of her students' testing scores, students have earned $44,000 in scholarships. Tanya has infused a love of language learning at South Salem High School, and she provides a space where students can learn German at a high level through our IB program. In addition, she provides spaces for students outside of school, such as the German Club and the German, National German Honor Society. Her classroom is a safe place for so many students. 
Tanya provides tremendous leadership for her profession in support of students and educators, and she is incredibly well-respected in her content area as a native speaker. Her lessons are an excellent combination of learning the language as well as the culture. And one of her students in their letter of recommendation writes, her passion for teaching is evident in every class and her fostering of discussion truly promotes the most diverse and engaged classes I've ever been a part of. Thank you, Tanya, for all that you do on behalf of the staff and students at South Salem High School. We appreciate you and we celebrate you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tanya, and it's great to see you here tonight. Thanks for being here. All right, our next spotlight is uh, a spotlight that we're gonna do in Spanish. So if you are an English, uh, only listener, if you put on your, if you're in the boardroom, if you put on your um, ear set, we're on channel three. And I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Lisi Aguilar Nelson, our director of elementary um, education. Hola, muchísimas gracias. Buenas noches, Presidente Carson Cunningham, miembros de la Junta y Presidente y Superintendente Christy Perry. Esta noche me complace destacar una organización comunitaria ubicada en Turner, Oregon, a solo unas pocas millas de Salem, la Granja Anáhuac. La Granja Anáhuac es una organización comunitaria que ayuda a los estudiantes y miembros de la comunidad a desarrollar un entendimiento intercultural. Una visita a la Granja Anáhuac brinda conocimientos históricos y culturales acerca de los pueblos indígenas hispanoamericanos a través del aprendizaje participativo y colaborativo. La Granja Nahuac busca unir y colaborar con las comunidades indígenas para sembrar semillas nativas de estos lugares. Por ejemplo, el cultivo, el cultivo orgánico de la milpa, el maíz, la calabaza y el frijol. Se esfuerzan por mantener relaciones con sus comidas y la forma tradicional de vivir la vida. Actúan como puente entre la época ancestral y la época contemporánea. La Granja Nahuac ofrece educación tradicional en agricultura, artes culinarias y culturales, salud y bienestar y lenguas nativas. Las granjas en nuestro valle dependen de la comunidad, de personas a quienes a menudo se les llama trabajadores agrícolas. Estos arduos trabajadores son la base que nos ayuda a mantener el suministro de alimentos y el sistema agrícola de este país. La contribución de la Granja Nahuac a la agricultura continúa siendo sirviendo a la comunidad indígena y creando un impacto positivo en el noroeste del Pacífico. Gracias a Jaime Arredondo, a Javier Lara y a todo el equipo de Nahuac. Muchísimas gracias y gracias por su atención. Y Jaime, muchísimas gracias por estar aquí con nosotros. And Assistant Superintendent Cobb, I'm going to call on you for a minute. Did you have anything since you can do it in Spanish to thank uh, Jaime, since that would usually be my part? Of course. Yeah, in Spanish. Yeah. Sorry, I caught you off guard. Just, just give Jaime a thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. Jaime, queremos agradecer de nombre de la superintendente y todo nuestro equipo por la oportunidad de visitar la, la granja y por la oportunidad que vienen adelante para que nuestros estudiantes puedan participar de todos los programas que usted está ofreciendo. Mil gracias y estamos bien emocionados por nuestro uh, trabajo en equipo. Thank you, Jaime. All right, our next, uh, our last one is Jennifer Colachicchio. Chico, our coordinator for student services, is our program spotlight tonight. Hi, Jennifer. Good evening. Hi. <laughs> uh, good evening, Chair Carson Cottingham, board members, and Superintendent Perry. Um, and I think I have uh, one of our students, Simeon, and one of our teachers, Alyssa Duke. If you'd like to turn your cameras on, that'd be great. Uh, to celebrate National Disability Employment Awareness Month, we would like to spotlight um, our community transition program. 
health of our young adults in one of our district's community transition programs. Part of the core content of CT is to build vocational skills and work experience to help our students with disabilities find and maintain employment in the community. And tonight, I'd like to spotlight one of our students who has done just that. I'd like to introduce you to Simeon Garcia. So Simeon, go ahead and yes. meet yourself. And can you tell us where you're working and how you got your job? Yeah. Yes. You guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yes. All right. Uh, yes, I've been, um, I, I've been working at Safeway um, on Tennant Street in my, uh, at, um, and I've been with the CTP program for so uh, for almost three years already, um, and I'm really great to be uh, a part of this and talk about what uh, my experiences um, beyond uh, having uh, a job and the and doing being able to be a part of the school and and being able to. Uh, just um, share my experience with you guys. And I really appreciate you guys being here to, for me to share. So Simeon, can you tell us why is employment important for you? Why is it important for you to have a job? <laughs> I like to earn uh, uh, money. Um, <coughs> um, I like to uh, meet and uh, new, I like to meet uh, people uh, in the community. Um, the other thing is um, a job that I will probably help a lot of people some days. Well, I'll help, I'll help a lot of people um, uh, in the community if they need it um, throughout the, uh, the time I'm there. And if I keep continuing to do my, my job, I, I will try to uh, uh, do what I gotta do to uh, just be a part of, of helping customers out and trying to be able to meet new people, new faces, new people, as I said, new people in the community and get, and just be able to help. Yep. And you've been working on being more independent. And independent, yes. As well. yes. Yep. Okay, yes. perfect. Good. So last question for you. What are you working towards next? What are your goals? One of my, one of my goals is budgeting and um, being more uh, independent, being able to graduate um, at CTP and being able to just work that goal and, and, and just achieving it, trying to be able to um, be done, and I, I, for me, it's, it, for me, it's for experience, I, I really, uh, try to, I really am trying to get, to achieve that, and trying to take a next step on what I'm going to be doing, uh, in the next couple of years, uh, throughout the, uh, throughout the like, next couple of months, and after I'm done that CTP. Awesome. Thank you so much, Simeon. And I'd also like to introduce Alyssa Duke. She's uh, Simeon's teacher at CTP, and she represents all of our community transition teachers. Alyssa, do you have anything you'd like to share? Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I just want to thank you guys for um, recognizing and spotlighting so many different um, programs in Salem Kaiser, and especially uh, for recognizing Simeon because he is doing such wonderful work and he's making us all look really good every day. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Simeon and Alyssa, for sharing your experience and the, sure importance, the importance of employment for our students. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. Yep. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Alyssa and Simeon as well. And best luck in your budgeting as your next goal. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All right. Next on our agenda. That was our last spotlight, right? That is correct. OK, so next is reports and presentations. And so um, that is the superintendent's report. And I will turn it over again to Superintendent Perry. 
All right, so I'm going to uh, get a couple other uh, voices in here tonight, but I'm going to start with our student advisor, Ray Lynn. Z has uh, prepared a statement to lead off the superintendent's report tonight. I want to be sure that our school district and community knows that October is LGBTQ AI History Month. LGBTQIA History Month was founded in 1994 by a Missouri teacher, Rodney Wilson. All, as of this year, LGBTQIA month, History Month is recognized by nine con countries, Australia, Canada, Cuba, Finland, Germany, Hungary, Italy, the UK, and the US. It is important that we as a community recognize that LGBTQAI his plus History Month and the differences between it and Pride Month. Pride Month is a month where queer people get to be who they are unapologetically. Pride Month itself is a protest driven from so Stonewall. We acknowledge that society is not where we want it to be, and in the face of that, we say we are who we are and we're not sorry for it. Whereas LGBTQAI History Month is a month to celebrate our history and to recognize how we got here today. While there are a lot of parts that overlap between Pride Month and LGBTQIA plus History Month, it's important to recognize both and not just one because it suits us, because that is false support. If you'd like to go and learn more about LGBTQIA plus History Month, you can learn more about it through podcasts, books, exhibits, and so much more. Some podcasts that are good to listen to that I would recommend are History is Gay, Unboxing Queer History, Queer is a Fact Meets Hi Queer History, and Queer America. Some books that are intriguing is Art After Stonewall by Jonathan Weinberg, Drew Sawyer, and Drew Sawyer. When We Rise by Cleve Jones, The Gay Revolution, The Story of the Struggle by Lillian Faderman, and The Men with the Pink Triangle, by Heinz Hager. And a, there is a current art exhibition that is going on that's called My Own Flag to Raise by Jessica Rayfield. It's at the Salem Art Association, or commonly known as the Salem Bush Art Center. It will be exhibiting until November 5th, uh, and all of these parts of queer history from, all these parts from queer history and Stonewall are so important for us to recognize because these are people that are in our family, in our community, and our students, and we need to make sure that they feel supported, seen, and loved. Thank you. Thank you, Raylan. All right, um, I'm gonna move on to Indigenous Peoples Day. I think it's suiting that we had our newly revised um, land acknowledgement this week, and I wanna thank uh, board leadership and Dr. West and our Native Education Department and both of our tribes who all helped us with the rewrite of the land acknowledgement. So um, thank you for that. Um, just a few comments on Indigenous Peoples Day. It was first discussed at the UN conference to replace Columbus Day in the US with the celebration in 1977. In 1990, South Dakota was the first state to rename Columbus Day, 1992 through 20. 20 various cities across the U.S. resolved to celebrate or recognize the day. In October of 2015, Governor Bill Walker of Alaska issued an executive proclamation. In March of 2016, Utah uh, failed to pass Senate Bill 170 with enough votes. Um, then in October, I can keep going through these, but 2020, the nation's capital finally passed a resolution to change the holiday to Indigenous Peoples Day. So it's really important to think about the length of time that it took to recognize the true um, holiday as Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, we um, celebrated yesterday at Indigenous Now event. Huge shout out to the Indigenous Now organizers down at Riverfront uh, Park. And Salem Kaiser had a booth. You can see a few pictures there. We promoted our Native Education Program, our Parent Advisory Committee, and uh, did some recruitment while we were there as well. So um, that was a, just a great event. And who knew it could be um, that warm on October. So it was a nice warm day down the riverfront. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight, we talk a lot about uh, family engagement and what does it mean to engage uh, families authentically. And I think the best and um, most important um, family engagement that's truly authentic happens in our schools. And so um, I think it's um, 
Is your, is your starting to freeze again? Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. Uh, so um, we had last, I think it was Thursday night, 1,200 people at Yoshikai Elementary. And the goal was to celebrate uh, Hispanic Heritage Month. And I got there and was inside a little bit ahead and came outside and the line was long. We had authentic food, we had mariachis, we had art. Um, and what you could see was pride, language, and community care. Uh, this student, uh, her parents were the uh, people who served the food and brought their business uh, to uh, the event. And uh, we were a little worried about the amount of food when we saw 1,200 people, but um, they fed every single one two tacos and or taquitos. And uh, there was lots of um, dessert but it was just a great event. And you can see um, the celebration of culture. We had smart reading there as well. And uh, the smiles on families' faces um, and really being able to engage in their own culture was really uh, heartwarming. So I thought that was just something really important. As we talk about family engagement, I want you to be able to see what it looks like out in a school um, because this is what our schools do. All right, um, the next thing is Crystal Apple nominations are open. Remember, we're partnering with the Chamber. We opened up the uh, nominations uh, yesterday, big uh, social media blast, and we, um, uh, they closed, sorry, on December 2nd. Um, so, Raylan and Isaac, if you have a teacher you'd like to nominate, the, the nominations are now open for the Crystal Apple. <laughs> All right. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to highlight you of a trend we're watching. Um, we have um, a very growing number of refugee students, which you know, um, but we've already gotten 42 new, new refugee students. Remember, a lot of them come with um, no English. Um, some come with formal schooling, some come without. Um, and uh, they're coming from uh, the continental Africa, Afghanistan, and the Ukraine. And Salem for Refugee has been approved for 250 more families. So that doesn't count the 42 students that we've already received. If all of those families show up and all have a couple kids, which sometimes there's more than a couple, um, that's going to be a really big influx. Um, our newcomer center at um, Waldo is already with lots of kids. We just got to really watch this. Rich, um, amazing students entering our community, and we need to really be um, prepared for that. Um, we have a uh, refugee family engagement uh, session coming in November, and I'll get that um, out on your calendars as well. All right, with that, I'm turning it over to uh, Dr. Udosnata, who's going to do our division uh, 22 report and you don't even get to be at the podium and you get to run the slides I get to do it all I know the mic's a little loud how's it sound Good. perfect good evening chair Carson Cottingham members of the board and superintendent Perry I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about division 22 assurances so our division 22 uh, assurances are a set of administrative rules that ensure that we meet standards related to programming services, instruction, planning, and more. Um, there's 54 assurances total uh, with the several subcategories that I'll cover in just a second. But um, these are largely driven by legislation. And then the legislation, uh, the ODE then adjusts the rules uh, annually, right? So um, when we went into COVID, our D22 assurances shrunk a little bit because there's only so much we can do when students were doing distance learning, and they expanded again um, when we came back to full-time in-person learning. And so you'll see an expansion in this year's report of the Division 22 standards. Um, do know that these aren't all the things that we do to run a school, but it's something that all the state, uh, all the uh, districts in the state need to um, show accountability for. So currently, um, we have tw uh, 54 standards. Uh, you can see a list right there. Um, and we kind of break these down into um, sub-subcategories. So curriculum and instruction, assessment and reporting, um, program and service requirements, high school diploma, health and safe, uh, safety policies and practices, and plans and reports. 
And for those, we need to make sure that we're um, hitting all the standards. So one thing that you might be thinking is what, or wondering is what do you do when we cannot meet the standards? And um, when we don't, what we need to do is write to the state, and we need to submit to our respect to the state reporting that we're out of compliance with the standard, and then demonstrate a plan of how we're gonna get back into compliance with the standard. Um, this year, we were out of compliance with one standard, it was our physical education standard. Currently, welcome Director Avila. Uh, currently, our um, PE standard at the elementary school is for 144 minutes per week. Uh, and 100 and, sorry, 150 minutes per week, sorry. And uh, 180 minutes at the secondary level, um, six through eighth. Um, there's a variety of reasons that we weren't in compliance this year. Um, some of the reasons is a scarcity of resources. We have some large schools that only have one gymnasium. Um, there's a lot of scheduling constraints, especially with our, with our large schools and then expanding offerings of PE. So that's something that we're working to expand in all of our elementary schools um, or to, to troubleshoot in all of our elementary schools. It's a little bit different at, um, at the middle school level. So at the middle school level, there is that scarcity of resources. We have a couple of schools that do still only have one gym gymnasium. But also there's competing values for um, amongst students for elective offerings. Um, right now we have six periods in the day. Four of those periods are um, core classes, math, science, language arts, social studies. And then that only leaves room for really one elective. And so in sixth grade, all of our students are required to take PE the entire year. And in seventh and eighth grade, they're required to take it for one period. And that's what we can really sustain given the, the um, shortage of, of space and the scheduling constraints that we have. Students do, though, have, option, uh, have an option to take PE throughout the year um, in the seventh and eighth grade. And all the students who have requested to take PE throughout the year, we've been able to um, fulfill those requests. Um, Another uh, example of classes that someone might take in lieu of PE are electives like music. Um, AVID is very popular as well, especially for um, our, our demonstrating schools. And so um, our students have some tough decisions to make when it comes to selecting an elective. But we are going to work on um, other alternatives to make sure kids have access to PE. So one example might be an early bird option where a student can arrive, arrive early um, and, and take PE or uh, an, uh, an after-school option for PE, or perhaps even an online model for PE as well. And also we want to let you know that EDGE um, uh, grades K through eight were um, able to fulfill the, the, the PE requirements. I know that was a lot about PE. And I think that's all we have for, um, for D22. And that's all I have for superintendent's report as well. Great, thank you. All right, that takes us to number four on our agenda, public comment. Um, as a reminder, we have selected speakers at random. We have public comment by Colin and Zoom, and we've allotted 45 minutes this evening to hear comment. Each caller will have three minutes. Electronic mechanisms are used for translation, so an additional three minutes for translation is not necessary. We have a countdown timer on screen for monitoring time. The timer counts down from three minutes, and at 30 seconds, it turns from green to yellow, and at one second, it turns red and plays a short bell to signal that time is up. Please also be mindful of your pace for our interpreters. As a reminder, all board members receive their written comment, which is posted to the website. We do have quite a few callers this evening, and if we aren't able to hear from you in the time we've set aside tonight for public comment, we do welcome you to provide your thoughts and feedback through email. And you can use the link on the website that says email the board, which will come to all of us. Okay. Director Chandra Geary, did you have a question? Yeah, I just had a question about Division 22. Can I share? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. The question is, uh, does the Division 22 require 
family participation in curriculum development and all those things you are listed. Uh, if so, how are we meeting? <coughs> Um, I think, <coughs> go ahead. I was going to say uh, family uh, feedback from the community when there's a curriculum adoption process, um, and that's where we would go out, and we, you will experience some of that this year with our health curriculum that we are adopting this year for K-5, and uh, families will have the opportunity to see the curriculum, see the materials, and provide some feedback or ask questions. So it doesn't require for all the other items in the Division 22. There is the ones that the first slide you gave a list of. Is the is the question? Is there a the parent family per, gets involved in, in all every of single one? No, there's not the, a family requirement in every single you. one. Thank you. It outlines the standards and the curriculum that that um, districts need to meet. Thank you. Okay, with that, I think um, we can get our first caller or person on Zoom up on the board. We are um, getting the timer up right now. We're having a little technical difficulties, but I can begin. Um, our first caller is Joelle tonight. Joelle, are you able to unmute? Star six to unmute. Hello. Go ahead. Hello. Go ahead. Good evening, uh, board. Thank you very much for taking my call. Um, I'd like to speak to the what traits we're looking for in a superintendent. Um, first of all, I'd like to say um, there are good things that Salem Kaiser does. Um, we have good staff that believe that all kids matter. They show up every day in a broken system to show love and respect and do their best to include parents in the education process of these students. Also, CTEC, I believe, is the best thing about Salem Kaiser. The options that this opens up for kids, the real world experience, the job interviews, field trips, and guest speakers show kids that they have so many options in this life, and that is amazing. It also holds kids accountable for their decisions by uh, having professionalism standards, which is something that the regular high schools are severely lacking. Um, CTEC is the best thing about Salem Kaiser, in my opinion, and it is the only reason that my kids actually attend any Salem Kaiser school. Um, in looking for a new superintendent, I would hope that the board would look for someone who cares about all kids, who um, makes data-driven decisions and um, is a uniter. Someone who makes data-driven decisions looks like someone who takes data reports, knows how to read them, and actually implements policy that makes sense due to the data collected. If certain groups are just screaming from the rooftops that there is a police or a prison, school-to-prison pipeline, whether it's true or not, and we make decisions based on that, like removing SROs from schools, that is not data-driven decisions. I would like to see a superintendent who actually makes data-driven decisions. I would also like to see a superintendent that supports the parent-child relationship above all else. Parents are the primary educators. We send our kids to schools, and that is our choice and no one else's. And what happens to them in the schools and the things that they are taught should be up to the parent. It, there should be transparency. Parents should get to decide what things are taught to their child and what things are not taught. We shouldn't have to go about getting a Freedom of Information Act to find curriculum that's being taught to our kids in school. Um, thank you very much, board, for listening, and I am hoping and praying that um, you guys find a great new superintendent and uh, that families that have still cheated out of the chance to send their kids to their local neighborhood schools because of the state of our schools, um, that that will turn around. Thank you. Thank you, Joelle. Next caller. Our next um, caller will be joining by Zoom. Tyler, are you able to unmute and turn on your camera? Thank you. 
Good evening, board chairs, directors, and superintendent. I'm Tyler Scala Lakeberg, the president of the Salem Kaiser Education Association, speaking on behalf of my members. Last month, I spoke about hope and coming together. Now, a month later, I can say that hope is dimming. We appreciate the district listening to the need for cell phone policy and having staff-wide conversations about behavior expectations at the beginning of the school year. Those two things combined with students being more regulated has led to a smoother start and less school-wide behaviors. However, COVID is still in our schools, causing many sick educators. As a result, many of our educators are giving up their planning time to sub in other classes. It is only six weeks into the school year and this is becoming a heavy burden. Last month, I spoke about last year's collaboration with district leaders to help problem solve on the many issues we are facing. However, this year, it seems as though we are back in pre-COVID times and the attitude is all as good. District leaders are leaning in. However, they're not hearing our members. Educators are on the brink. There's a mass exodus from public education across the nation. And last year, we experienced that here in Salem-Kaiser. This exodus is not because people want to leave teaching. It is a cry for help that our system of top-down decision-making is not working. There are still too many demands on our educators. Their primary, primary jobs are to create engaging lessons, reflect on teaching and student progress, partner with families, and provide meaningful feedback. These important tasks take time. However, so many educators are in meetings, professional development, and performing other duties that their primary job is swept aside with the expectation to do on their own time. We appreciate the district will be giving back an hour or two for educator directed time one month, each month, but it's not enough. High class sizes increased with student needs are proving to be too much for our educators. On top of that, we have fewer instructional assistants and more and more initiatives being added to our plates. All of this combined has created a workload that is not manageable or sustainable for anyone. Who is coming to fill in the ranks when our educators leave? I have said it several times, we cannot fix all the problems of public education, but we can rewrite the narrative for Salem-Kaiser schools. To do this, we need to do a deep, deep dive into listening to our educators. They are the experts and they are often the last to be listened to, if even given the opportunity. Our educators have the heart and determination to move mountains for our students. Let's let them do it. Instead of directing what needs to be done, let's ask our educators, what supports can the district provide for them? Thank you so much. So they can meet students' needs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tyler. Next caller. Yes, our next caller is David. David, are you able to unmute? Star six to unmute. If not, we can um, move to Angelique. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Hello, my name is Angelique. My pronouns are they, them, and I will not be saying any more information about myself due to the fact that there are white supremacists on the school board and watching this meeting. I want to start my testimony by saying that I completely support and want to uplift transgender youth in our district. Based on recent events, it is clear that transgender youth do not have adequate supports in this district and need more. We need to see permanent and not emergency for mental health resources and other equity supports in the district. Part of supporting transgender youth also starts by looking in towards the school board and the beliefs of individual school board members. We have seen multiple times that the same school board members who have been transphobic and homophobic are also supporting outside efforts in this school district that are also transphobic. For example, the various book bans that have been attempted towards necessary LGBTQIA plus books in our school libraries. Some of these efforts even attempt to create a narrative where they believe that transgender students do not exist, that transgender students simply suffer from mental illnesses and other harmful beliefs. Allowing your fellow board members to continue supporting these transphobic ideologies is what contributes to the death of transgender youth and it is unacceptable. 
Considering that the same transphobic and homophobic school board members want to bring up the conversation about SROs again, let's talk about how SROs are harmful to transgender and BIPOC youth. A recent study by Lambda Legal it demonstrated that 35% of transgender youth of color have heard anti-LGBTQ plus slurs from SROs. 15% of transgender youth of color have been verbally assaulted by SROs. 30% of transgender youth of color have also had their belongings and bodies searched by SROs. 39% of transgender youth of color felt like they were treated more harshly by SROs because of their identities. 67% of transgender youth were sent to detention and 27% of them were suspended. Transgender and BIPOC youth do not deserve to be disproportionately targeted in their school buildings where they are meant to grow and learn. SROs place these marginalized youth on the school to prison pipeline and deportation pipeline and that is a fact our youth deserve to graduate high school go to college if they want or achieve all of their aspirations in life just like white cisgender and straight students there is a lot of misinformation and discussions about sros and i would point anyone to actual verifiable studies which all prove that sros do more harm than good in our schools loose has also recently posted information on sros and school shootings which show that sros do not stop school shootings the time to have conversations about SROs were back in 2021. Instead of spending so much time going backwards, we need to be investing these funds into the youth and doing what we can to uplift and support them. The full $1 million still hasn't been reinvested. I think we could also be using this time to find an actually anti-racist superintendent because we need someone that will think about and prioritize the needs of our youth, especially those most marginalized. We do not need someone like Marty Hayen, Daniel Bessel, or Satya Chandragiri, who are white supremacists, to be in such a powerful position. Thank you, Angelique. Next caller. David is now on mute. So David, if you are able to go. Are you if there, David? Not. Our next caller in line would be Zach. And he is joining by Zoom. Okay, we'll come back to David. Um, Zach, go ahead. Zach, are you able to unmute and turn your camera back on, please? Boom, because uh, the host disabled. It says my uh, video was disabled by the host. Can you hear me? Oh, we can hear you. Let's try to get your video back on. Um, Okie dokie. There we go. There we go. We can see you. Hi, everybody. How are you guys doing? Great. Um, go ahead. Yeah, so anyway, uh, like I was saying while I was muted, my name is Zach Defoe. Uh, I run the Salem Playhouse over in Kaiser. We're an acting school uh, or an after school acting program, I should say, uh, for teens. And then uh, we work with adults as well on the weekends. And I just wanted to call and kind of have a change up of some of the other calls and stuff that you guys were getting and try and have a uh, productive, positive conversation about maybe finding a way where we can have some more specific after-school programs that fill the needs of our very diverse and eclectic group of students that we have in our school district. Um, I think I speak on behalf of a lot of people in our community where who have after-school programs or have youth programs that would love to work with you guys and that would love to find some positive things and work forward or move forward um, in this process that has been pretty difficult uh, as I've been hearing so far. Um, not really in this conversation politically or anything like that. I think the kiddos are the number one priority, period, the end. No discussion uh, further needed in that with me. I would really, really appreciate hopefully after uh, tonight to maybe sit down with a couple of you guys or all of you guys at some point and figure out how we can do some things for kiddos after school that is positive, gives them a place where they feel like they belong and build that foundation so that we can give them confidence and give them a bunch of different skills that they can take off with them to either college or out in the real world, depending on where they'd like their future to be. Um, and I just hope that we can have a better line of communication and dialogue. I understand that it's a very high emotional time and there's things being said back and forth that you know i don't really agree with but that's doesn't really matter i guess but i hope that we can have a really good positive dialogue so that us those of us in the community that really want to help can actually help 
and um, like I said, help these kiddos. Um, if you know who I am, you know who my family is, you know, we're people who have worked in this community and with the school district for a very, very long time. And when my grandfather was alive, he had, you know, started SCEF with um, Mrs. Lemons. And I apologize for not remembering her first name off the top of my head, but I got a lot going on in my head at the moment. But, um, you know, and I thought SCEF was a really great program and it did a lot of good stuff for kiddos after school. And I'm, you know, hope that we can maybe work toward doing something like that again um, and work together. Because I think that's the most important thing that we can do right now is find a way to come together and quit yelling and screaming at one another and, you know, heal our community in some form or fashion. Now I do that through my avenue through acting and I can tell you for sure that I have seen kids grow, not just like as actors and actresses, but they're gaining confidence. They're learning how we as people communicate in a healthy way. Thank you, they're Zach. They're learning how to be, okay, perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. That... Appreciate it. We appreciate you being here. Next caller. Our next caller will be joining by Zoom. Um, Linda, are you able? Oh, Linda's microphone is not working. Um, so Linda, if you could jump off and then jump back on, that might fix that problem. After that, our next caller would be Vincent. And Jordan, it looks we can see the timer now in the room. Is it? Are we? Good, yes, good it to should go work. Now? What Yes, we'll okay. be able to start that on our next caller. Okay, perfect. Uh, Thank you. Vicente, Thank you. are you able to unmute? Hello? Hello? We can hear you. It sounds like Linda is ready now. Do you want to go, Linda? Uh, good evening, Chair Cunningham and Superintendent Perry and school board directors. I want to affirm the hands are, and words are not for hurting prop, proclamation. However, I'm very concerned oh, that the school district and administration is hurting the very children they say they want to help. And I'm sorry, there's a lot of noise here. I'll try to move. Um, but you talk about not bullying and about welcoming everyone, yet you treat the staff and other board members with contempt and exclusion. You disrespect half of the community by sidelining three board members. So the proclamations sound nice and what we want, but it doesn't seem like in practice that's really what happens. And we've been coming before you for the last year trying to have some constructive conversations. And I don't understand why you mischaracterize how we're coming and the attitudes that we have and what, what we really care about. Um, we want all kids to belong and we know that the relationship is vital for success, um, but it is a parent-child relationship that makes the most difference in determining how successful a student becomes. But it seems like you're trying to keep parents out of the equation. And you know we have a lot of things that we disagree with probably on, on what should be taught. And it's not our business about how you teach and what you teach necessarily, but we have a right to know what's being taught and we have a right to direct the care of our kids. And I think that we should be partners and we should work together. And I don't understand um, why it seems that, there, that the district continues to put up barriers to allowing parents to participate, whether, whether it's volunteering um, in, in the classroom or just having a, a honest discussion about our values. Because um, uh, schools teach values, we know that. And um, it, 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 it's our right to make sure that the values that you are teaching align with our family values. And so I know you guys have kids and I'm sure that you care about what is taught to them, to them and that you wanna be respected on how the teacher uh, refers to you and I just hope that we can start working together and do what's best for kids and not just um, not just go through political posturing because I know you said that we are doing this for political um, 
propaganda and stuff like that, but we're not. We really care about kids, and I feel like you're making it. Thank you, Linda. We appreciate you being here. Next caller. Um, I'll try David one more time. David, okay. I see that you're on mute. Are you? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead, David. My name is David, he, him pronouns, and I won't say no more information about me due to the fact so many incidents with white students calling me racial slurs and targeting me. I don't feel safe around my school. Many students don't feel safe at the school because of the white supremacy on students and staff. After we removed costs in schools, we can use that money to have more staff of color and counselors of color. We need to reinvest, not oppress. Thank you. Thank you, David. Next caller. Our next caller is joining by Zoom as well. Cassidy. Go ahead, Cassidy. Looks like her mic, oh, just connected. Go ahead, Cassidy. Hi, my name's Cassidy Trout, and I'm here with a friend, Freya, and I'd like to relinquish my time over to her. Thank you. Hello, my name's Freya Lee. I'm with Gays Against Groomers, and I'm wanting to speak out against transitioning kids and indoctrinations being pushed in school. There's no rhyme or reason for it to be taught in school. I don't know why people are insisting they should be doing this. And school counselors aren't even qualified to discern if somebody has gender Excuse identity me. disorder. We can't hear you very well, and we're also having issues with our interpreter. They're not able to hear you with like the feedback, or I don't know what else is going on. Okay, sorry. We're next. We're out in front of your building protesting. So I'm Freya Lee. I'm with Gays Against Groomers and Trans Against Groomers. I'm a transsexual woman. And I'm speaking out against the indoctrination of kids and teaching queer theory and CRT in schools. I'm against transitioning children. Trans is an adult only space. Kids should not be involved in that. The effects of GNRH inhibitors and GNRH and Lupron and puberty blockers is detrimental to a kid's health. It is not a pause button. You can look at Jazz Jennings and many other people look at Chloe Cole who spoke out against SB 107 in California. I'm friends with Chloe. And that little girl is brave. And for speaking out, she got destroyed online and publicly. Instead of being heralded as an autistic youth that had the strength and courage to speak, she was shut down. And the own group is shutting them down. The indoctrination that is being pushed by people is insane. It is gross overcorrection that is being done to kids and it is mindless. And I think we need to re -decide, decide what we're really trying to do here. Are you really trying to help trans people? Or are you just trying to transition children? Are you trying to opt them out of the gene pool by giving them puberty blockers? Because that is what is happening with when you give a kid puberty blockers. They, it is not reversible. It is not. D-trans is far more experimental than transition is by a mile. There's barely information on D-trans. You can use Shapeshifter's example where she went on testosterone trying to go back and had allergic reactions because of her endocrine system being messed up. Let alone the effects when you take somebody and have vaginoplasty that goes wrong and they don't talk about the effects with that. Incontinence, lots of feeling. You can look up Tulip R. His name is Richie Horan. He's a friend of mine. And what happened to him was barbaric and he got abandoned by the NHS after his bottom surgery. Nobody helped him. Nobody helps the D-trans and they get silenced and shut down. It needs to stop. And what you guys are doing is a gross over correction. Trans kids should not be a thing. You should not be sitting there indulging children in a space, especially when they're conflating with so morbidity. Thank you, Chloe. Next caller. Our next caller Hi. is Thank you. I'm sorry if I go Vincente. 
Vincente. Vincente. Star six to unmute. Hello? Vincente, go ahead. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Vicente, and I like to talk about I like to talk about counselors instead of classroom schools. I personally had very bad experiences with cops, and with its long-lasting effects, I was in eighth grade when a cop pointed a gun at me. I was just trying to get into my own house. They thought I was trying to break into my own house. Luckily, I had my mentor with me to say, hey, stop, that is a kid, you know? And I feel like hiring more staff and educators of color with ethnic studies, cultural and gender affirming programs for middle schoolers and high schoolers, also arts and music activities in schools where it's predominantly black and brown schools. I feel like that's where it should be going to. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Vicente. Uh, next caller. Our next caller is <clears throat> Nayeli. Nayeli, are you able to unmute? Go ahead, Nayeli. Hello? Go ahead. Hello? Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Nayeli. My pronouns are they, them. I am calling in today to speak on a few points. To start with, I'd like to make clear my support of police free schools and how that supports the hands and words enough for hurting proclamation. Our schools and campuses must continue to remain police free for the safety of our students. Their physical presence only increases the impact of the school to prison pipeline on black indigenous students of color. Remaining free of police presence should be a priority to the district as it is directly correlated with our youth feeling safe. Next, I would like to support a search for an anti-racist superintendent who is committed to justice and truly using an equity lens. Because this would also support the hands and words are not for hurting proclamation. It should be bare minimum to have leadership who is willing to work towards eliminating systems of oppression that affect our BIPOC youth with our LGBTQIA2S plus youth, our disabled youth, and all our youth with intersecting identities and abilities. This leader should create long-lasting change that affects pos uh, positively affects generations to come. Along with creating long-lasting change, I would advocate for permanent equitable funding to be used for students' mental health. This also benefits the hands and words are not for hurting proclamation. Our trans and queer students' lives depend on it. The changes that have been made by adding funding and investing them into student mental health should be permanent. As long as you use these emergency funds to fund them, the help for our youth can be ripped from under them. Using emergency funding is like using a band-aid for an open wound. I support education, books, and resources that help uplift our LGBTQIA plus youth and helps them feel empowered in their lives. Funding should be equitable and permanent. This would make me feel safe as well. Thank you, Nayeli. Next caller. Marilyn is our next um, commenter and she'll be joining by Zoom. Go ahead, Marilyn. Oh. Hello, good evening, Superintendent Perry, Chair Carson Cottingham, Vice Chairs, Directors, and Student Advisors. My name is Marilyn Ellis. I'm the Vice President of the Salem-Kaiser Education Association, and I'm here to speak on behalf of our members. My comments will address the goal of creating safe schools. In life, there are times when things are hard, but we get through them with the help of friends, family, and sometimes professional support. Likewise, in schools, there are times when things are hard. COVID, distance learning, returning to in-person, all have been hard. Our educators know that we can move forward and make progress, but only if we have adequate support. Currently, support is lacking. Many students return to school this year better prepared to learn, but not all. Some are just as dysregulated as last year or perhaps more. A small number of students can cause significant disruption to learning and overall safety. We raised this issue over and over again last year, asking for things like consistent behavior policies, 
timely reporting of student-caused injuries, a protocol for situations when a staff member is injured, and additional help with students who have the greatest difficulty regulating their own behavior. The district had all of last year and this past summer to develop plans, and they did make progress around promoting consistent policies, selecting a training to intervene with violent behavior, although not yet implemented, and a team to problem solve on site, not yet activated. It took more than a year for these plans to be formed and they are not yet in a functional state. We are pleased that there is some progress, but it is not enough. Just this morning, district leaders explained the new plan for assisting staff after an injury. The plan is to have the principal check in on the staff member later that day or the next morning. This is not a new plan. This is the plan they proposed several years ago. The fact that our district leaders believe this is new means that it hasn't been happening. No one is checking on our injured educators. Sometimes they're given an ice pack and sent directly back to class where they very likely have to teach the same student who just injured them. We have asked that injured staff members have some time to assess injury to determine if medical care is needed and to allow them to return to a calm state of mind before going back to class. We asked again just this last week. There is still no such protocol in place. Our educators have utilized everything available to draw the district's attention to these concerning issues. We are frustrated by the lack of action and appeal to all of you to help our educators and help our students. Thank you. Thank you, Marilene. Next caller. Our next caller is Belle. Go ahead, Belle. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello, my name is Belle. My pronouns are she, her, and I will not be saying any more information about myself because there are white supremacists watching this meeting. A month ago, I went to my counselor's office to get my class schedule changed, and my counselor told me that they all have been very busy, some of them, uh, some of them having up to 1,000 student requests to do. That makes me feel bad because they aren't paid enough for how much they do, and there aren't enough of them to help all of the students. This makes me feel like I can't go get help from them because they are overworked. And other students of color or transgender students probably feel the same. I think we need to have more permanent funding invested into our mental health resources because it's hard to do good in school when you can't concentrate or don't even feel like living. I think the rest of money from the SROs should go towards our counselors and other mental health resources. There has been a lot of stuff going in on my school this year, especially with the recent suicide of a stu student in the district. It is overwhelming to try to concentrate in school. I have a lot of anxiety about falling through the cracks like before, because I know that if I stop paying attention for even a little bit or focus on something else in my life, that I will be so behind and hardly have any resources to catch up. I have been doing pretty well this year because of tutoring services that I received from the Loose program, but there, are, there is, isn't much available for me from my school. There is a mentor that does help students in my school, but she is mainly in the detention room. So if you are in detention, you can't get a lot of help from her. That feels messed up for students of color like me because it means that our education doesn't really matter and that we are basically incentivized to get detention. One of my friends got put in school suspension and she actually likes it better in there than in normal school because she gets a lot more help from her with her schoolwork and homework. It's messed up that we have to get detention or get suspended to get individual help. Because this getting put in detention and or suspended as a student of color puts us in the school to prison pipeline. But a lot of, I mean, but outside of the loose program, this is really my only option because I come from a low income BIPOC family and they can't help me because they are also working and also didn't get a high enough education to understand what I'm doing. This isn't just my experience. This is true for a lot of other students like me as well. I want cops to stay out of school and I want more money to be invested to help kids like me. Thank you for being here, Belle. Chelsea is our next caller tonight and she will be joining by Zoom. Go ahead, Chelsea, if you're there. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, can hear you. Okay, I'm joining from outside um, at Student Services uh, with about 40 other parents because we're not allowed in the building tonight. Um, I am in favor of the hands and words are not for hurting proclamation. 
But more importantly, I'd like to see policies and procedures actually followed in cases of bullying and violence. As we've seen, these proclamations are just words. They are not solutions. I'd like to also address the recent state test scores, especially the 11th grade math test scores. I was appalled to see that only 6% of math McKay students are meeting standards. How is this possible in a school that is already receiving extra funding? I personally know of two student athletes that earned athletic scholarships but were unable to meet admission standards at those colleges. I've read that college recidivism rates are around 70%, meaning that our children are having to pay for an education they should have already received. Here in the real world, if I complete, completed 6% of my sales calls, I'd be fired. If you are really serious about getting the students college and career ready, get back to reading, writing, and math. Colleges, trade schools, and employers are not going to waive requirements for common knowledge. I strongly suggest that you offer math classes at local high schools for recent graduates, just like you are offering English classes. Our students deserve to be properly educated. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Next caller. Our next caller tonight is Luvia. Luvia, are you able to unmute? Star six to unmute. If not, our next caller is Elizabeth. Hello? Hello? Hi, is that Luvia Hello? or Elizabeth? Yes, Luvia. Luvia, go ahead. My name is Yuvia, and I will not be saying any other information because of the white supremacy here in this meeting. My pronouns are she, they. I'm here to talk about how you all need to keep police out of the school. And quite frankly, me and the, a lot of the other youth in my community are tired of white people trying to be our voice. We're really tired. I want you all to know that I'm a lot, one of a lot of the youth in my community that are directly impacted by the police in and outside of the school. When I go to school and I see cops, I don't feel safe. When I, why can't I feel safe when I go to school? Why does the school see me as a threat? I'm not a threat to the school. I'm just a student coming to learn. When people talk about bringing back cops into school, I see nothing but racism and how little they care about me. What I know is that instead of bringing back police, you all need to make sure the money is actually spent on helping students like me when I'm in school. I need to make sure there is funding for helping my mental health and emotional well-being. I believe that we need more counselors and psychiatrists, especially counselors and psychiatrists that are people of color so they actually understand where I'm coming from. I also believe that we need more teachers of color because I don't have someone who is teaching me that looks like me. I know that a mental health room and an in-school medical clinic would be very beneficial for everyone at my school since we spend most of our day inside of school. And because I know that people in my community can't afford or have medical aid, my community has been advocating for these for a long time. And now is the time for change. I need you all to make all of the mental health funding that is now in place to be permanent and not emergency funds. I also need for you all to make permanent permanent funding for educational programs too. When you don't make these funds permanent, I know that my community will suffer, will lose and suffer because of it. I know that when there's no more emergency, there's no more opportunities for me and my community. Thank you. Thank you, Lupia. Do we have Elizabeth now? Yes, that is correct. Elizabeth, star six to unmute. Hi, my name is Elizabeth. I'm commenting on the hands and words are not for her in proclamation, the board goals, and the superintendent hiring process and standards. The hands and words are not for hurting proclamation should be passed. However, the policy must be enacted in a way that protects most, those most at risk of violence and abuse in our schools. This proclamation, proclamation has been passed many times, yet we know the culture in our schools continues to protect students and employees who behave in anti-trans, racist, and otherwise bigoted ways at the expense of students surviving that abuse. Um, we know in part from listening to you speak in these meetings that our schools continue to punish students surviving both overt and covert forms of violence um, in our schools while those creating these abusive conditions are protected. How will this board create a new precedent for how this policy functions in our schools? 
Similarly, the board goals that heavily emphasize equity should um, it's a good thing that excuse me um, emphasize equity. However, the input and presence of um, openly bigoted Marie Hayen completely undermines any trust that these goals would hopefully build with the community. How can this board act equitably when a board member continues to be openly aligned with white supremacy, as shown in the recent voting against um, Hispanic Heritage Month, a month that honors a large portion of our community? The process of finding a new superintendent must be designed to find a superintendent who not only speaks on it, speaks about equity, but has demonstrable knowledge and skills um, in the history and present day of white supremacy um, in our institutions, our culture, our school district, and a deep knowledge and intention in dismantling white supremacy and creating something new and better um, with extensive input from our community, such as the students who continue to show up to these meetings month after month. All forms of policing, such as SROs and security personnel, should be permanently ended. Uh, that funding should go to mental health programs and equity-focused programs. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And this will be our last caller for the night. Our next caller is Abigail. Go ahead, Abigail. Good evening. My name is Abigail Eckhart, um, Director, uh, Chair of Carson Cottingham, and Superintendent Perry. Um, I'm actually right outside the school board meeting with about 40 other parents who would like to address concerns to our school board. However, we've been pushed out again and again and are forced to meet outside or in our homes and not really actually make connections with the ones who are in charge and leading our our schools and in charge of our children's education. So I'd like to address the hands and words are not for hurting um, proclamation. I recognize this proclamation from my time working as a child abuse assessment transcriber for Liberty House. This proclamation would be better if it were actually followed. Every single month, parents and youth are subjected to a broad array of verbal attacks, accusations of white supremacy, and I do not feel like my own elementary age students would be safe at a board meeting especially when I was told by a board director that I had white privilege and needed to read the book, White Fragility. When you affirm hate speech on your Facebook post on a regular basis, you show the entire community that you are only for a specific group and no one else. That is not safe nor welcoming and it harms every one of us. It harms mostly biracial families like my own. If one eye goes blind because of the constant barrage of accusations at every meeting, then the entire vision of the community is no longer in focus. Please live by this proclamation. Don't just pass it, but abide by it. Don't allow speakers to interrupt, be interrupted by your special interest group. Don't malign parents and lie about them to the press. Don't set unrealistic boundaries by enforcing mediation that you know one group will not cooperate with. You're holding the entire community hostage for the actions of a few, and that is not the right thing to do. There's no real reason to um, have closed meetings anymore. You need to abide by open meeting laws as well as the other laws that you're not following in the meeting. At every school board meeting, you invoke the spirits of Native religions at the opening statement, and you've been made aware that this is not acceptable nor lawful. Um, and unfortunately, I don't see this changing because I brought other concerns to you that have legal attachments, and they've never really truly been followed through with. I really hope that the search for superintendent is fair and includes parents from all communities, not just special interest groups or minority communities. I am a Hispanic minority and I am not a victim and I don't want you telling my children that and I don't want you teaching my neighbors that. And I found books recently in my own library that say white people are responsible for all racism and that's just not true and it's not acceptable to be telling that to our children and our youth. I really hope that Going forward, we can do better and be better and really listen to parents of all communities. And thank you very much. Thank you, Abigail. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. Um, we will now take a break for 10 minutes. It is about 7.16, so we'll be back at 7.26. Thank you.
live. The light up there. I don't know if everyone knows the system. But. The, there we go. We're back. We're on air. Okay. Director Hyen, we, is your audio working? I saw you talking. I didn't know if you were asking a question. No, we're. I don't have any electricity here. We're trying to <laughs> do the flashlights and stuff so I don't look like a, you know, scary thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's Halloween. It is, yeah, it's Halloween month, so we're good. Okay. Um, we're now moving on to number five on our agenda, our action items. And first up is 5A. And so I am going to turn it over to Superintendent Perry for a review of this item. All right, uh, we have, um, Ann has submitted a video for us tonight for the um, hands and words are not for hurting. She is apologizes for not being able to be here tonight. She was hoping to be here in person and is out of state. So with that, um, if our team behind the scenes can turn on the video. Good evening, school board directors and Superintendent Perry. My name is Ann Kelly. I'm the founder and director of the nonprofit education organization, The Hands and Words Are Not For Hurting Project, founded 25 years ago here in Salem in 1997 with our public schools that began a movement from Oregon to all 50 states and 28 foreign countries. Ours is a public health approach to a public health crisis of domestic and family violence, child abuse, bullying wherever it exists, self-harm, and suicide. Our annual proclamation is to bring about community awareness while providing opportunities to come together in unity for all of our schools to take to heart the Purple Hands 14-word pledge, not just for this week, but for a lifetime. Our Oregon governors and Marion County commissioners provide the same proclamations for our citizens every year. Immediately after the Uvalde, Texas murders of 19 children and two teachers, I contacted Olga Cobb, elementary assistant superintendent, asking, can we now re-energize the Purple Hands Pledge in all of our Salem-Kaiser schools? Olga saw the value of teaching the Purple Hands Pledge when she was principal at both Highland and Chavez elementary schools. She immediately understood my question and committed to all elementary schools in our district to implement our pledge and program this October 2022. Thank you, Olga, for your compassionate leadership. Now I will share an email I received in September, this September, from a former Perrydale Elementary student, and I quote, the Purple Hands Project came to my elementary school when I was nine years old. They made me feel safe enough to disclose to them years of sexual abuse I had been enduring. They reached out to my mother immediately, along with giving her many resources. I will never forget you guys for helping change my life and giving me a voice. Hands and words are not for hurting. That is embedded in me forever, and I will continue abiding by it and teaching it to others. Thank you, end quote. Thank you, Olga, for understanding how important both the visual and verbal repetition of this pledge is in opening the door for children to trust and disclose any abuse to get the help they need. I also want to thank our student activist, Neha Serena Basan and Sophia Miller, South Salem High School, and Ronit Sethi, Sprague High School. They will shine a light on self-harm and suicide prevention at the Marion County Commissioner's meeting where they will accept our Marion County Proclamation and lead everyone there in taking the Purple Hands Pledge. And thank you, Marion County Commissioner Kevin Cameron, for providing your voice on a brief video supporting our school district's commitment to continue this life-changing life-saving 14-word pledge. Educators here and around the country and internationally are saying, the Purple Hands Pledge school-wide helps students build skills to reduce their impulsivity and increase their empathy as a universal school-based program with minimal distraction from class instruction time. Our Purple Hands Pledge teaches empathy 
self-control, accountability for our words and actions that either help or hurt ourselves or others. In conclusion, I know without a doubt the hands and words are not for hurting project and our simple, consistent, and memorable Purple Hands Pledge will only help create a safer, kinder, more inclusive environment in all of our schools, K through 12. Everyone counts, everyone is accountable. Our shared vision of safe schools, safe homes, safe communities begins with educating our children at the earliest of ages and continues as they grow into young adults, carrying it forward to the next generation. Thank you for your consideration and for all of your hard work. Hello, I'm Kevin Cameron, one of your three Marion County Commissioners. The message I want to share today is something that I learned back in 2014 uh, when Ann and her people, students, came to Marion County to a board session and we did the pledge. I've got this bracelet on right here that says hands and words are not for hurting. And you know, that's I've worn this bracelet since 2014 and I've given two of them away. One in Indonesia to a young man who admired my bracelet and wanted to know what it was. And another one on a beach in Belize where a young man came up to me and just wanted my bracelet. And I, through a translator, explained to him what this means. And I just want to share with you that this is probably one of the most important things that we can learn at a very young age. And even in today's society, we've got some adults that probably need to you know, remind themselves that our words are not for hurting. Our hands are not for hurting. And so I can't be here, be there with you today to take the pledge, but I want you to know that this pledge is really important. And I don't always get it right, but hands and words are not for hurting. And I just want to remind you, and hopefully you'll remind your friends and your family that uh, wearing these bracelets or the lapel pins or whatever that you get today, uh, that'll help remind you that we can um, treat other people with respect and with the love that they deserve. So thank you and uh, thank you for allowing me to share this with you today. Okay, thank you. Um, we wish Anne could have been here tonight, um, but we're, we were very um, glad that she had that wonderful video made that we could share. Um, I'm now going to ask student advisor Brennan to read the proclamation, please. <clears throat> whereas a world without abuse and violence is a dream we all share and whereas we acknowledge that any form of mistreatment of another is abuse and whereas abuse can be in the form of verbal mental or physical and often escalates to further violence and whereas we believe that all people have the right to live free of abuse and violence and whereas we believe that every person can make a difference in stopping abuse and violence by not using violence to control others, by not tolerating any form of abuse from others, and by developing healthy relationships at every age in all circumstances based on respect and equality. And whereas self-harm and suicide must be acknowledged as a serious pandemic, er, public health crisis, as numbers of victims continue to escalate in children, teens, and adults. And whereas we, re we recognize and support the efforts of district staff in our community in promoting respect and e equality for all people, teaching conflict resolution behaviors, and helping students to learn how to stop abusive cycles. And whereas we recognize the hands and words are not for hurting projects, Purple Hands Pledge is an effective tool in abuse and violence pre prevention education. Now, therefore, the Board of Directors of Salem-Kaiser Public School proclaims October 16th through 22nd, 2022 to be the 25th Annual National Hands and Words Are Not For Hurting Week in Salem-Kaiser School District. We call upon our community to observe October as the Hands and Words Are Not For Hurting Week and encourage everyone in the community to take, take the Purple Hands Pledge it. Pledge. Thank you. 
Okay, I would at this point ask for a motion. Chair, I would. Director Chandra Geary moves the action I'll, item. I'll second motion. Director Avila seconds. Um, is there discussion? Director Chandra Geary? Yeah. Thank you very much, Chair. Yeah, I, this is a very important pledge. And I, I remember when I first started the school board, this is my uh, little wrist band that I got from Ann. And uh, uh, Dr. Kelly and Mrs. Kelly, thank you very much for taking this. Now more than ever, this is really very important. Uh, I have publicly committed and stated about a need for nonviolence in every form. And this is a very important reminder for all of us. I further like to quote, you know, the Quaker statement that says, enemy is the person you have not listened to. You have not heard their words. And it really starts with at that level of authentically listening to each other without any judgment. Because a lot of times our emotions turns into actions or if we cannot sit and have a dialogue, uh, there is a good chance that people act out. If what you can't speak out, you tend to act out. So that's why I really like the way you, your proclamation talks about nonviolence using not just hands but words also. So we can be mindful of what we say, uh, how we say it, and how we treat each other, and truly develop empathy and an inclusive community. And so now we need more than ever, ever before. So I would like to ask my fellow board members, please, let's support this. Not just wear a wristband, but uh, let's kind of find a way to become the role model to help the rest of our community and school district to truly embrace and internalize this. So with that, I will stop, and thank you. I will be supporting this. Thank you, Director Chandra Gary. Director Hyen. Yes, thank you. I, I find it somewhat ironic that this is on the agenda. I mean, it's on every year. But uh, month after month, hurtful lies are spoken against individuals in the boardroom. This is abuse according to this proclamation, and it doesn't adhere to our board policies. It would seem that this proclamation only applies to some and not all. Never, nevertheless, I will be voting in favor of it. Thank you, Director Hyen. Anyone else? on the board. Um, I w I'll just say I'm definitely in support of this pledge. I think it's really critical um, that we reaffirm our commitment every year. Um, I know I, I spent my whole professional life working um, to prevent child abuse and elder abuse and abuse um, against individuals with disabilities. And a lot of time volunteering um, on a domestic violence hotline. Um, there's far too much abuse, um, and I, I just think we all need to reaffirm our commitment to ensuring that we're protecting kiddos. And um, I know each year we do um, the mandatory reporter training as part of our um, responsibilities as being on the school board, and so um, we can be those eyes for kids in our community who are in really, really dangerous homes with, unfortunately, um, loved ones that don't have their best interests at heart, um, and we can be that safe and supportive resource in our schools. So I'm very pleased to support this work. Director Chandra Gary. Well, thank you very much. The, the, the words are very important. Uh, uh, you know, in a time where I see a lot of uh, groups and communities are, you know, we really have to start humanizing each other. That's why the words are very important for me. And we need to start authentically trying to understand each other and bring communities together. As adults, what we do is really important because children often do what we do, not what we often tell them to do. So we can be, as adults, demonstrate how to 
be respectful, not to assume about each other, not to judge each other, and to really demonstrate uh, not just empathy, but what compassion really means. Uh, and it starts with us. And we really have to start demonstrating then. Uh, sit down and um, have a discussion and listen to each other. Because once we can start, anything that is speakable is bearable so that people don't act out and children don't act out. So, you know, a lot of things have happened, but we need to move forward and we need to start authentically listening to different communities and different people. Even though they may have different ideas, their lived journey, life experience. Words are, can be harmful. Words are very damaging. And words can be far more damaging sometimes. And people do get emotionally harmed and they get scared to even speak and ask for help. So please, this is a very important pledge, not just in a resolution or word, but we really have to start practicing, learning those skills. In the last two, three years of COVID or uh, social isolation, it looks like we have all need to retrain ourselves, that empathy muscles in our brain, and then get back to listening to each other. We can't be using silence or violence, so that's why this pledge is very important. Please take it home, and I'm going to take it home, and I'll support this. Thank you, Director Chandra Gary. Others? Okay. Um, I will call for a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those aye. Okay. All those opposed? Passes unanimously. Wonderful. Okay, and now I'm going to ask our other student advisor, um, McDonald, student advisor McDonald, to lead us in um, doing the Purple Hands Pledge on this 25th anniversary. So, uh, raise your right hand, I assume, and uh, recite the pledge with me. I will not, I use, will not my use my hands, hands or, or my, my words for hurting, hurting myself or, or others. others. Great. Thank you, everyone. Okay, now we will move on to, um, I believe it's 5B, um, the approval of our board goals. Um, so as background, I'll do a quick review. We have a board plate in the agenda packet um, that goes over the work that we've done um, leading up to this point. Um, but beginning in the 2021-22 school year, the board um, has been working towards updating board policies, drafting a board operating agreement, and a superintendent board operating agreement. The board held work sessions on April 13th, June 2nd, and June 28th, during which time we worked with Vince Adams from the Oregon School Board Association and discussed, brainstormed, and did homework on concepts for draft, drafting operating agreements and formulating board goals for the 22-23 school year and beyond. So this work is now embedded in goal number four for our board goals. Um, and that goal states that we will equitably improve board governance through policy updates and accountability structures. Um, board governance, or the BGs as we refer to them, um, will be reviewed first, and then we will incorporate the work that the board began on the board operating agreement in that process. So the next thing we did is we worked on developing our own strategic goals aligned to the Salem-Kaiser Public Schools District st Strategic Plan. And so the board began working on the goals in a brainstorming session that we held in the summer on July 19th. And from there, our board leadership team drafted initial goals and strategies by themes. And we did an initial written draft that was part of the board agenda in the business meeting on September 13th. The board met then on September 27th in a work session for the purpose of discussing and finalizing the goals. So we looked at all the input from that work session and the public board meetings where this has been discussed. And tonight, the 22-23 board goals are presented for action. This is an important first for Salem-Kaiser Public Schools to present a comprehensive set of goals for the Salem-Kaiser Public School Board. 
This action aligns with the strategic plan of the district and uses key performance indicators as one way to monitor the goals of the school board. This set of goals and strategies will assist us in a clear focus on work that improves the learning for our students and as a board recommits our focus to the community in an authentic and transparent manner. So this item is now presented for action. And I would accept a motion. I will motion that we accept the 22-23 the school board goals. Okay, like Director has, Avila has moved and um, second vice chair Guzman Ortiz has seconded and I will open for discussion. Director Shanta Geary. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, th these are good goals and we had spent a lot of time discussing in the work session. Uh, I just wanted to kind of get a clarity uh, moving forward that will there be some time where we will move, uh, take these goals, these broad goals into measurable, uh, you know, goals, uh, measurable goals and timelines and indicators, key indicators in between or key measures in between so that we have a way of making sure we are sticking to the timeline and uh, we have some deliverables to the community and to the an accountability structure that we can build. Yes, absolutely. As we've discussed in the last several meetings, um, there are deliverables built into the goals themselves in the document that is posted with the agenda. There's work products and metrics. And as we discussed at the last meeting as well, when we do the listening session and learning session with the board on the KPIs and the other student performance data, that's the point at which we would set the measures that are associated with all of those data elements that we are going to learn about. We will see, you know, that state data, we will see how we're doing on our own KPIs, and then we would make recommendations as a board as to what we would like to see the percent improvement in particular measures of, of like critical importance to us individually as board members. Thank so you. it should be very visible during that session and then it would be updated and reflected on our board goals document. Thank you. Absolutely. Director Avila. Yeah, I'd just like to just um, give you a uh, board leadership praise on really capturing um, our voices and what we'd want to accomplish and then aligning that with the district strategic goals um, I believe this will guide us along the way that we can all continue to review and abide by um, our board goals. Thank you. Thank you, Director Avila. Other discussion? Okay. Oh, I just, you know, thank you. I'm, I'm super excited for this as well. It's kind of hard to just extract one or two things that I look forward to. I think overall, I've appreciated the process um, that we've led to collaborate on these um, for all directors to be able to, you know, give input and um, and feedback on the goal. So I, I look forward to the following year and just hoping that we can work together and um, use this as our um, our path forward. So thank you. Thank you. Other feedback? Discussion, I mean? We're in discussion. Okay. Um, well, Wait, can I add one oh, thing? Did go the ahead, student advisors know, notice where I put them on there, where they got? Yeah. There you go. Just looking at okay, the, good. We're talking about the food. Yeah. yeah. The food is on there. Yes. The food is on there. We made sure. Yeah. <laughs> Director food, Chandra Gary. The food was good tonight. They say <laughs> that's the kind of meal they serve in every school. No, oh. it's not. <laughs> the, the kind of meal they're going to start to serve in schools. Yeah, yeah so, so uh, we'll, we're help, we'll hold them accountable to that. lunch week. Yeah, it's the uh, the foodie program that they've got in some of the middle schools and are rolling out in the high schools. Yes, and they've been very attentive to dietary because restrictions. I don't, eat, I don't eat this kind of dinner every night at home, I'm <laughs> telling you. It's just dal and rice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we had a very nice sampling from some of our awesome programs, but we, we also understand there's room for improvement in our strategic goals. 
Um, I would just say before we vote that I really appreciate um, the whole board coming together to provide ideas. I know we don't agree on everything all the time, but I think this is a good work product that incorporates really important things to each of our board members and then shows the work that we're gonna do collectively together to move the district forward. So I really appreciate it, um, that about the process um, and that we are really focused on the things that I've heard each board director talk about as the most important things in serving on a school board to focus upon. So with that, um, unless anyone else has anything to add, I would call for a vote. So all those in favor of adopting these board goals? Aye. 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 Director Han? Hi, and no, I'm a no. Thank you. Okay, so um, everyone was in favor, I believe, um, here, and Director Hyen is a no, just to, for the record. Thank you. Okay. Um, next up was our added unexpected agenda item. Um, so this is item 5C. Um, we are declaring a vacancy on the board. Um, this is an official step. And so there is a board plate also associated with this that I believe will be added to the website if it's not there yet. Yeah, it um, should be up already. Okay, it should be up. This is an agenda modification. Um, and so yesterday at 5.28 p.m. on October 10th, board leadership, the superintendent, and legal counsel were notified via email from Director Danielle Bethel that she was resigning her position as a Salem-Kaiser Public Schools board, School Board Director effective immediately. And so Oregon law, specifically ORS 332.030, um, is vacancy in office of director, and that governs um, and declares and fills a board position vacancy in a variety of situations. And so, We've listed the subsections of the law here. Um, and I don't know if our, Paul, would you like to speak to some of the process regarding this vacancy since this is our first time doing this? Sure. Um, the Oregon Revised Statutes 332-030. Put your mic a little closer so we're, we're getting you on video. Uh, uh, ORS 332-030. 030 provides what the school board must do when there's a vacancy in the office of a director and in the case of a resignation um, subsection 4 uh, requires the board first to declare uh, a vacancy and that's what you're going to do tonight uh, then the remaining board members shall meet and appoint a person to fill the vacancy and that person has to satisfy the eligibility requirements of the statute, which would include being an elector of the district, meaning a voter. Um, you'd have to, that, that person must be within zone six, which is Director Bethel's zone. Um, that director, once appointed, shall serve the remainder of the term um, the, the language is a little confusing, but the essence is since Director Bethel's term ends June 30, 2023, that the appointed director would serve from the date of appointment through June 30, 2023. And the successor, um, whoever is elected to fill the position from 20, 2023 through 2027 would then take the office on July 1, 2023. So again, simple steps, declare a vacancy, talk about the process for filling the, filling the vacancy, which I think you'll touch on tonight a bit, um, and then um, <coughs> you'll, you'll receive candidates from Zone 6, um, and you'll have a process that you'll discuss for, for seeing those candidates, having the public know who those candidates are, and then ultimately you will uh, appoint a successor for Director Bethel. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, 
So what we're proposing to do tonight um, is declare the vacancy. Um, and then what we've laid out in the board plate is a, a process for appointing the new director. And so if everyone's following along on the back page of your board plate, um, the proposal is that the board would direct the district to develop an application process, including the application form and receive applications. Um, the process would open by this coming Friday, October 14th, and close at 5 p.m. on Monday, October 31st. Um, ap applications will be received via means that will be specified in the material. Um, and as Paul mentioned, they, um, the, any applicant has to have the qualifications that are required to serve as the director of Zone 6. Um, and we've linked to the board zone map so that the public and everybody is aware of where those boundaries are. Um, and you must be a registered voter of that district and not be an employee of the school district. So then we would review candidate applications and the board would interview qualified applicants and take public comment at its November 8, 2022 regular board meeting. And all qualifying applications would be included in the agenda packet for the meeting, which would be posted 48 hours in advance of the meeting. Though personal contact info would be required on the application for affirming candidate qualifications, um, for security and privacy, that would be redacted in the agenda packets. Um, and if needed, the board may hold a special board meeting on November 15th to finalize the decision. And so, um, again, the board leadership is recommending that the board take the following action tonight, that we declare that vacancy, intent to appoint a new director to complete the term left vacant by Director Bethel, which is through June 30th, 2023, and direct the district to develop the application process, which we've essentially laid out in this board plate and receive applications on behalf of the board. So with that, um, I would take a motion. Director Chandra Geary. Yes. I move that uh, we accept the process that you highlighted, to declare the vacancy and start the process. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Director Chandragiri, could you please, oh, um, yeah. I, I mo make a motion that we declare the vacancy and start the process as highlighted required by the law so that we can fill the position. Great, Director Chandragiri has made the motion. Is there a second? Second. Director second. Hyen, Director Hyen seconds the motion. And now we'll open for discussion. Um, First Vice Chair. It's not so much discussion, just um, I'm listening to the interpretation at the same time, and so I just want to make sure that they got the chance to really capture all of mm -hmm. the pieces. Um, so I'm just going to reiterate really quickly. Um, so the application process will open Friday, October 14th, and close on 5 p.m. Monday, October 31st and applications will be received via means that will be specified in the application material. And the applicants must have the following qualifications to be considered for the position, and it will be the responsibility of the candidate to affirm these qualifications by signature on the application. Be a resident of Salem-Kaiser Public Schools Zone 6 and have resided in the district zone six for a period of one year preceding appointment, be a registered voter of the district, and not be an employee of the district. We'll take public comment at the November 8th, 2022 regular board meeting. And if, if needed, the board may hold a special board meeting on November 15th, 2022 to finalize the decision. Thanks. Thank you. I know it's a lot of detail in there going too fast. 
Um, Director Chandragiri. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, it's not as much as the process, but I just want to, with your permission, take a few minutes to share uh, just a few words about uh, Commissioner Daniel Bethel and our director. Uh, Commissioner Bethel and uh, Director Bethel, in all my years of service in three countries where I've served, I never come across another inspiring, ethical, hardworking leader in a public servant like you. I can understand why this decision was important for you and your family. I have no doubt about that. But thank you for allowing me to serve alongside you during this darkest time in this recent history. It has been a very emotional day for me and between me and my wife, and my wife was crying and kind of consoling me. Throughout this time, I was inspired by your high ethical standard, inspiring leadership, and your courage to speak truth to power. There were times, very difficult times, when we, you and I served in the leadership position and all kinds of pressures. I will miss you, but the standard you set for us will continue to inspire me and hopefully others. I will continue to see you as my moral compass as I serve our community. I've seen you work tirelessly between school board and serving our communities. We're devastated with the wildfires. You didn't, it's not just the families, but even their animals, you are going around looking for feed for them in the middle of the night and also taking care of our school and school district and our community. So I'm very proud of you. I truly thank God for the opportunity to serve alongside you and consider that the greatest blessing that I have had. So uh, we, will, we will continue to do what is best for all our children and hopefully our community and everybody will see uh, what an inspiring person and a leader you have been for all of us. So thank you very much. Uh, today I can't speak anymore. I'll probably write a little note later. So thank you. Good night. Thank you, Director Chandra Giri. Director Hyen. Thank you. Danielle, your passion and fighting spirit will be greatly missed. I know you will continue to work hard for the people of Marion County. I appreciate you and, it, and I will miss you. Thank you, Director Hyen. Director Avila? Yeah, I'll just say, um, I remember the day when I, when I first met uh, Danielle and found out she was a school board member. I did ask her, you know, what got her involved, what got her interested. Um, and that was two years before I became a board member and really a year before I'd even really thought that is something I wanted to pursue. And so just uh, appreciate working with you and I uh, wish you all the best. Thank you, Director Aviva. Um, I would also just like to thank you, um, Director Bethel, for all of your dedication. Um, I know a number of us on this board are also full-time public servants, parents, and volunteering our time on the school board, and it's a lot. And so you've committed so much of your life and time to this position, and, um, you know, I think everyone in the community is grateful for all of the service and that, you know, you truly do want to make our schools the best they can be. And so um, I know that we will still be in this community together working towards the things we all care about. Um, but thank you very much for your service on the Salem-Kaiser School Board. Okay, with that, um, we had a motion, we seconded, we had discussion, we should be able to vote now. Okay, so all those in favor of declaring the vacancy and moving the process forward as described, say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Okay, it passes unanimously. All right, that takes us to, um, let's see, our consent calendar. So I would take a motion. Oh, Director Hyen. Yes, I, I will give a motion in, in just a moment. I just wanted to point out my normal uh, this month. And I wrote it down. Where did I write it down? Ah, I'm not seeing it. Start here. I believe there were uh, 12 or 14, I can't remember exactly, uh, resignations and two retirements. So I make a motion that we accept the consent calendar. I'll second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, not on the consent calendar. Aye. Aye. Unless, but if you have something to add, please. Yeah. I just wanted to follow up on the public comment from our teachers union. The vice president uh, really highlighted a serious problem that our teachers are going through during this uh, e extraordinary time where we have lots of resignations. Teachers are going through some very difficult time. So these resignations are very, I mean, it really needs some thought and uh, I just want to say, you know, thank you to those teachers, but I wish there is something we can learn and really incorporate what our teachers refer to and the teachers union refer to and see how we can work on helping our teachers feel engaged, involved, empowered, and feel safe and be part of our school. It's a solution that, because it's been over, now it's almost like 200 and 40 or so resignations in the last one year where it's kind of keep, lost track. You know, we can have lots of money, we can have resources, but we really need teachers. Teachers are the backbone of everything. So we need to hopefully do something and get a drill down on what's going on and get our teachers to sit down and authentically kind of help us figure out because this is not sustainable. This is not really tenable for good education. Teachers are bandwidth gets shorter and shorter. It's going to affect all our children and their education. So I just wanted to put that in the public record and hopefully one among the times we can really talk and bring some different perspectives and see what can we do differently. So with that, I have no choice but I'll vote. Yes, for this consent. Okay, thank you. Um, so all in favor of adopting the consent calendar? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nope. Okay. Um, next, how's everyone doing? Do, does anyone need a break? How are we doing? Nope. Oh. Break? Okay. We'll do a five minute, sorry, Hank. <laughs> so you just joined. Um, we'll do a quick five-minute break here. It is 8.11, so at 8.16, we'll be back.
<laughs> okay, welcome back. Oh, we don't have mics. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, so we are now moving on to number seven, um, and this is the superintendent hiring process and standards. And so I am going to turn this over to um, Hank Harris. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if you're joined by Kathleen tonight or not, Hank. Okay, it's just Hank um, tonight um, to explain a few things about the hiring process. So I will turn it over to you now. Great. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Board, and good to see you again. Um, I'm going to just be with you briefly, I think. Um, there are two documents in your agenda that we're going to speak to tonight, and I believe you're taking action. I believe you're you're voting on that. I, mean, I can't see it, but maybe if you could nod or give me a thumbs up. Yeah. I think that's the plan, right? Yeah. This is a discussion item tonight, like first reading, and they'll take action in November. Got it. Okay. Thank you for that clarification, Superintendent. So um, what you're seeing is uh, really the, the – shouldn't be any surprise because these are what you uh, – what we discussed just last week, uh, the agreements that the board made. I, I do want to, um, I just want to take a moment to to thank, and I, I hope I did so last week as well, but it's not, it's not always uh, a simple matter to get uh, a large board um, to calendar events and to commit to dates in such a, uh, a relatively short, short time. You did that in the course of the meeting last week and including three long weekend days that you are looking forward to uh, after the start of the new year. So I just want to, I want to thank you um, for committing that level of time and for being so agreeable as we built the calendar that I think will serve your community and particularly your kids really well. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, so the document that that uh, is called the superintendent hiring process and standards is an outline of agreements uh, or conversations that we had last week that specified pieces of the um, process. And again, uh, these were all talked about. So this is really just codifying the document, making sure this is a reflection of what you think you agreed to, especially knowing that it will not be approved tonight, but it will be approved in November. So if there's any questions, now would be a great time to do that. Um, the parallel document is the timeline. And um, also, these are with the dates that you as a board came to a consensus around. And I, I'm going to speak, if I can, to two um, specific items. This is this is just to sort of um, give a little bit more detail than what's in the document. So if you if you will allow me to do that, and then um, if there are questions, and, and maybe there are, maybe they're not, let's address them. But the two things I want to point out on that, if you look at that timeline, um, one is we are um, we are two weeks away from the beginning of engagement sessions, and a lot of work has been done already. So first of all, board, thank you. Um, I believe we heard from either all or virtually all board members. You know, I gave you 48 hours, I think, and y'all honored that and uh, came up with a list of uh, groups that you'd like to see represented. I think in total board, uh, there were around 70 groups that board members um, surfaced uh, in terms of groups that might meet with the engagement sessions. And as you'll also recall, the, the engagement sessions are a piece. They are not the totality. They are a piece of the engagement work. And there are 20 slots for the engagement sessions. So your staff is already, and I met with several of them today, is already hard at work to figure out how to put those puzzle pieces together. Um, if, and there will be some, um, there will be certainly a great deal of interest in the Salem-Kaiser community to inform the process so I just want to reiterate that in addition to the engagement sessions, uh, which focus really on three specific questions, what's great about the district, what are the challenges that the new superintendent will face when she or he comes on board next summer, and what are the qualities and characteristics that you, if you were a non-board member, I'd say, what are the qualities and characteristics that you would be looking for if you were a school board member? So those are the three questions. and whether. Whether a, a community member or a staff person is participating in an engagement session or in the online survey, it's the same questions and we, we collect that data. So um, don't be heartbroken recognizing that there's a limited number of engagement sessions and there's a lot of individuals who um, we are looking forward to hearing from as they inform the process. 
Um, by October 25th, which is two weeks from today, we will be ready to begin um, those engagement sessions. And we will also be opening the online survey uh, and, and working with your comms team, publicizing that greatly throughout the, uh, throughout the metropolis uh, to make sure that students, parents, families, staff, community members all have opportunity that they know it's there and have the opportunity to inform the process. So I said there were two things I wanted to speak to. That was one. The second one has to do with the very next line item, which is the, um, the public release of the, of the Salem Kaiser's next superintendent criteria. So if you're, if you're tracking the time frame, we finish, just go and move your eyeballs back up a bit. We finish the online survey on November 5th. Between November 5th and November 16th, Kathleen and I will be deep in the data. We'll be deep in the work of reading and reviewing all the input that has come from uh, community members. And we will be putting together a Salem Kaiser's Next Superintendent Criteria document. And that will be ready to be distributed publicly on November 16th. You want to actually take action on that till November 30th which allows actually a, a nice amount of time for that document to be circulated out in your community and for public feedback to be solicited. And the date by which the public, so this, this date is not on the, on the timeline per se, but I want you to know that by November 28th, uh, which is two days before your approval date, you board members will receive the, um, the feedback, the public commentary, the public feedback on that document and um, so I want you to mark in your calendar somewhere, however much time you think you need to review the public commentary between November 28th and November 30th, so that you can come to the meeting on November 30th, ready to either adopt or recommend tweaks or so forth um, to that document. We would very much want that document to be approved by November 30th so that we are ready to open the vacancy, open the recruitment window on December 5th. So those were my two specifics that I wanted to call out. Um, and I think we can open this to conversation discussion that you might have with each other, or certainly if you have questions for me, I can do my best to try to answer. Okay, great. Um, Director Chandra Geary has a question or comment. Yeah, Hanks, I was kind of going through your uh, hiring process standards. And you know, one of the best practices when we want to hire using equity lens and is to kind of deduct the names and just start with the merit, whether they cut the standard for the merit. And once we kind of narrow it down, then you release the thing so that the implicit bias in seven of us or six of us don't kind of spill over. That's what they teach us. I and mean, at least that's what they taught us. So we, I thought we discussed that topic in the last did, time, yeah, but did. it didn't get into this document. That's the reason, because we really want to get to that standard of not allowing any of our biases to spill in based on the name or identifiers. So sure, and if, if the board, I'm not sure what direction the board would go on that, but if the board gives us direction to do that, then we, we will certainly accommodate that. So yeah, I think, I think we agreed potentially last meeting that everyone wanted that. Um, in the, when we received, like your example was 40 applications, <laughs> I think. Um, so in that hypothetical, in that batch, it would be names redacted. Does that make sense? Really arranged to do that, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, there might be, that does add a clerical piece that we'll, we'll have to take care of, but yeah. we'll, okay. we'll figure out how to do that. You know, Thank you. Chair, if, I, just, if you don't mind, if I just want to explain it so that it doesn't confuse anybody, the goal is to make sure that we start with the best qualification and the experience, et cetera and then introduce the name because that's supposed to be the best practice when we want to really intentionally recruit people and uh, still make sure that the merit is there and then we can discuss how otherwise the implicit biases can just yeah, focus on the all, name we all understand and agree yeah that's I think what it's a we great idea if i remember right yep we did we agreed i i agree we're all in favor right yep okay right. So Hank, just let us know on the clerical piece, what we can do to assist. I think we'll do it at a, I mean, it's a very nominal charge. I just wanted to be transparent about that. Okay, thank you. We'll do that on our end in order to maintain the confidentiality that's required in the process. Thank you very much. 
Okay. Um, other questions? Thank you for laying it out like this um, with all the updates. I appreciate it. Go ahead, Director Avila. Can you restate again the amount of time that, that will be required of you and your team to provide us with the summary of the, the community intake that gives us about two days to review? Uh, yes, I think though it might be better for someone on staff to do that because we're not intending to be an intermediary between your community input and the input you receive. So I'm, I'm presuming, but someone tell me if I'm right or wrong, that you're getting the raw data from your public and you're reading that. The way uh, I think it's laid out here is uh, they take all, from all the engagement sessions, that's a Kathleen and Hank thing. They take it all, write it up. When they um, submit to you the written documents that we submit publicly, then the public comment on that comes to you on that Monday morning. Okay. So that's the time to, um, you'll want to spend a little time reading because you'll come into that meeting on Wednesday night then having read the public comment to decide if you want to make any recommended changes before voting on it. Great, thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands of directors. So I think we're we're good then, Hank, unless you have any other info for us this evening. Uh, I don't think I do. So thank you, board, rolling up our sleeves and moving forward in your process. Thank you very much. And thanks to Kathleen as well. Gotcha. All right. Um, we will move to our next agenda item. Um, number eight, information and standard reports. Superintendent Perry. Yeah, um, this is your first uh, data report. We went and um, reformatted just a little bit so you had a five-year look back over the data. Um, so it is a different report, um, but not, it has all the same data just with um, kind of a different um, look to it. Uh, the panorama data is not uh, finalized yet because we do that, um, it's not, the window doesn't close until April, so there isn't any new information to report. Um, and then you also have in your packet the Division 22 assurances that um, Dr. Udo Sinata shared in the superintendent's report. So with that, that's my only uh, comments about your written reports. Okay, thank you. Um, any comment or questions on the reports? I know I had one. Um, I've heard a lot about um, a lot of misinformation in the community about um, unprecedented numbers of um, referrals to law enforcement and arrests. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just looking in here on page, I don't know what, it says page five of the data report. It's page 22 of our packet. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like, so the year the pandemic began, there were 77 referrals and no arrests, if yeah. I'm reading that correctly. So um, the, uh, we didn't capture, we captured referrals, but mm -hmm. not arrests. So actually these should be, um, I think they should be just a mark out or a not applicable in the arrest column. I'm looking at Suzanne because we didn't capture that data. So the school related arrests we started capturing uh, last year. So there was one school related arrest mm -hmm. for the entire school year last year. In sep this is just September. Yes, mm -hmm. thank yeah. you. Yeah, it's just the month. Is, we're, we're comparing month over month, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So where is the cumulative number then for the whole school year? Is uh, that we, my next page? <laughs> no, uh, we will add that as okay. we add the number. So next, next month you'll get October and the October year over year and the cumulative of all those, if that's what you want. And then it will show each month accumulated. I think that would be great if others agree, like if, if that's something the board's concerned about, I know we hear a lot about the school to prison pipeline, I would like to know, yes, over a school year, mm -hmm. that would be, okay. I think, interesting. And maybe the work group that's gonna begin um, would also wanna see that cumulative mm -hmm. look. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. Mm -hmm. If the rest of the board yep. is good. Yeah, tagging the rest of the months, right? We'll mm -hmm. look back from September. 
Okay. Yeah, so your next one will show October and the accumulation of October, September, October, year over year. Yeah. That would be great. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. And I'm looking at Suzanne to, and she's makes if she has any follow up question. I, I do have just a clarifying question to make mm -hmm. sure I understand. What we're looking for is um, an, an accumulation over the course of a school year. Mm -hmm. So this is September, September's totals. Next month will be September and October, and then the those two months combined, and it will be um, displayed over a five-year period, not necessarily all of 21-22 right now. Um, rather, we're doing a month-by-month -month comparison or a point in time in a given year compared to a point in time over the previous five years. I think for, I mean, my opinion for the purpose of the board would be looking at total referrals and total arrests by school year, understanding that the current school year is going to be only what we've experienced so far. Mm -hmm. But it, so I understand that you're comparing September of the 21-22 school year in this one, right, to current September school year. Correct. So, yeah, so, so it, it doesn't. Would be better to see, I think what happened last year, the whole year, and then looking at, at where we are in comparison to that for this school year. So you do want to see the whole year for previous years and then just where we're at for this year? I think unless there's a really good reason that you feel showing the board the month-by-month -month comparator is important, which there very well may be, I just don't, for me, I'm not running a school, right? So I, I assume there are times when we have behaviors spike um, but I'm more interested I guess at the board level of just seeing the year-by-year -year comparator uh, but I know director first vice chair has a question or comment um, yeah no I think it would be really interesting to see and maybe a little bit easier to digest um, and track if we're able to see like month by month comparisons but also accumulating as we go I think like as uh, Director West mentioned, but because that way we can see, you know, in September of this year, we have had five referrals to law enforcement and three school related arrests. September of last year, we had 10 referrals to law enforcement and then one school related arrest. And then just kind of keep tracking as we're going of like, are we continuing this trend of going, of, of going downward of less referrals and less school related arrests? Um, and I think it would get kind of confusing to see a whole year as opposed to like, um, like compared to our current numbers. And then it would, I think that would also help us identify what month or what season is it that it seems like there's more rates of referrals mm -hmm. and arrests and disciplinary issues. Okay. I think this is the, maybe we can take mm -hmm. it back and discuss and yeah, also punted to that committee, because I know everybody likes to see data in a little bit different way, and we don't want to, sorry. I started this, so. Um. <laughs> well, and I just want to uplift, we do have the dashboard. We do have the dashboard, yes. Um, I'm just interested, because it seems like there's been a lot of chatter around this, and I want to make sure the public, we're, we're really clear with what's happening right now. Um, but others have comments? Director Chandra Gary. Yeah, thank you very much. You know. We do have this Spark uh, uh, dashboard, so we, c we can also individually see it. You know, the, one of the purpose which helps me as an individual board director is to see if the trend is going up or not. Because there could be a given month where there could be a sudden spike, but that by itself is not important. But if there's a trend going up, then, we, then probably we can ask the question saying, why is the trend going up? Again, comparing September of last year to September of this year, without any other months, it's also not helpful because sometimes these trends keep going up, and sometimes along with this arrest, there could be discipline problem going up. So many other things go up and down. So it really helps as an individual board director for me to see, is this going up? If so, what can we do is, uh, then we can come back and ask which policy is working, which is what kind of training is needed. Just individual month or a spot 
cross-sectional data is not very helpful at all. If you simply say 10 arrest, that doesn't mean anything. 10 compared to what? Or are we kind of going up? That's the reason I prefer you keep on adding every month, just like what you used to present yeah. before in each uh, board packets. That way we have a tendency to see, okay, last five years this was it. And the 12 months kind of recurring numbers are going up yeah. or down. So mm -hmm. I'm a little confused, and I think you're confused too. So did you want to ask the first question? Well, yes, and, and to be clear, so September compared to all of 21-22 also doesn't mean much um, because that's not really a point of comparison to use an overused cliche, it's apples and oranges. Although we may be talking about overall the same collection of data, we're not comparing the same period of time. So it's hard to draw inferences mm -hmm. when we're comparing data in that way. We can display it that way, um, it's just very difficult to generate questions and inferences from that. Okay. I think the best thing to do is have the committee work on this mm -hmm. and what we, I know this was a compilation, like, to be fair, right? This was put together. We've been providing it regularly because there was a lot of work done on it, you know, in previous boards. Um, and the goal is to have the, the folks working on safe and welcoming schools yeah make sure we're looking at all the right things and we have it in the ways that the board can understand. And so my apologies for just <laughs> bringing that up. And um, I think we'll have good discussion in that work group to get what we I think it's good discussion need. here, though, so thank you. OK. Um, all right, any other discussion on the data reports, information standard reports agenda item? Director Avila. Just one. I mean, we can see the biggest difference um, all these impacts, I guess, or cases and situations are in the middle school level and a drastic uh, fall in, up in our high school level. Um, so just, you know, let's keep a focus on that and mm -hmm. where the behaviors, trying to get some explanations of why some of these, why this behavior continues going on. Are the right resources need to be refocused to the middle schools? Um, what can we learn uh, from this data at the middle school level? Thank you. Okay, that brings us to board reports. Um, so why don't we just go ahead and go down the line. Um, we'll start with our two student advisors. Um, we'll each attempt to keep it to a couple of minutes for our board reports. So um, student advisor McDonald. Yeah, um, first I'd like to just share some things that are going on at my school. Um, we had our first senior meeting today, so we got our Jostens. Um, that was kind of exciting. And then this Thursday, we have our first assembly since COVID. So a lot of excitement around there, too. Um, I've also had the privilege to do some peer mentoring down at Herod Elementary School. And it's just really warmed my heart to see all these little kiddos learning. I get to go out to recess with them. Um, and it just reminds me of like the innocence of the elementary schoolers and um, how dedicated they are to their learning and the kindness of the teachers. Um, and then just kind of touching on what um, Director Avila just mentioned about the middle schools. I wanted to highlight an effort by Straub Middle School um, and one of the counselors there to work with West Salem High School to get peer mentors down um, to middle schools. And I, I'd encourage other middle schools to do the same because um, a, a peer mentor, a senior or junior from a high school can have a really long lasting, profound impact on a middle schooler who might be um, veering off in the wrong direction or, or who might not have the support systems at home. And so that's just another thing I wanted to highlight. But yeah, that's, that's kind of it. Great. Thank you. Student advisor, Brennan. Uh, so we had a couple things happen here in the last little while at Sprague. <clears throat> we had our choose to, say, uh, choose to Stay Pumpkin Patch and Fall Festival uh, this last Saturday. Uh, we already had Justin's visit us, and mm -hmm. yesterday and today we had the day to turn in, uh, for seniors to turn in their Justin's packets. Okay, so what's Justin's? Can, mm -hmm. you gotta. Oh, <laughs> Justin's <laughs> is the, uh, the. Um, the company that does like the caps and gowns and the. Yeah, oh, all rings. the cool stuff. Okay. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's all the same for all the schools. Because okay. There's pretty Thank much you. only one company that does Monopoly. it. Monopoly. Okay. Um, so yeah, for all those who don't know, that's what Justin's is. Um, and so currently we have a lot of seniors sporting senior gear, which is great. Uh, 
We, uh, Sprague hosted the first district advisory committee last week. Uh, and uh, as of today, we have officially kicked off our first Oli prep. Great. First vice chair. Well, um, the OSBA had a road show, um, and that was at the Willamette uh, Education Service District offices last week. Um, and a lot of it was discussing just making sure that all of the school boards are able to contact their legislative policy committee members and just gearing up for the upcoming legislative session. Um, and not to get bleak, um, but the outlook currently is um, concerning just because there's going to be a lot of change in the legislature. We're gonna have 30 new legislators and um, so there's going to be a lot of work that has been accomplished um, kind of undone because there's going to be a lot of um, freshman legislators that are going to see the number that they get um, for funding schools and think that we did it we funded schools um, <laughs> when in reality like the need is so much greater so we're definitely going to need the support of lots of community members in terms of contacting those legislators to make sure that we get um, the funding that is necessary and hopefully full funding that doesn't use our SSA or our corporate kicker to fill the gap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to highlight yesterday was World Mental Health Day and it was the perfect day to have the grand opening of the Saxon Calm Room at South Salem. And the, um, they built these amazing, a, a student built amazing Zen dens, they're calling them. Um, and they're just little spaces with calming light. Um, they have music um, and you can dim the lights, you can just take 15 minutes to reset, um, you know, have some mindfulness and get back to school. Um, the counseling team at South has worked very hard, and I know these exist at other high schools too, which I think we'll highlight in future board meeting. But what they wanted um, to emphasize the most is that the prior model in some of our schools, and in particular in South, would be that a student shows up at the health center to speak with the RN with anxiety, depression, um, usually a stomach ache related to some of the anxiety that occurs with school. And that would result in the student getting sent home for the day. And so that's a last day of learning. And this model, thanks to the calm room, um, allows students to take a 20 to 30 minute brain break and return to class um, at South High. And so this year, the team did shorten the breaks to 15 to 20 minutes, but they continue to see the same really incredible results. Um, it really gives the students a, just that 15 to 20 minutes to recharge and then return to their instruction. Um, they have already had so many people served. Um, 800 students have come to the Calm Room since last February, and then 300 in just this first month of school. Um, the average visit has been so far 31 minutes, and the most anyone has visited is eight times. And the students are not abusing the space by the amount of time spent or the frequency of a visit. And then they are returning to instruction and community. So it's a really wonderful advancement, I think, in our schools. And I know um, Director Inos Pressy and I got to visit a lot of the elementary schools who also have a similar approach, and they're seeing great results. Um, lastly, I also was able to attend what Superintendent Perry mentioned, the Indigenous Peoples Day celebration at the waterfront yesterday. Um, our Native Education Parent Advisory Committee and the Native Education team had just an incredible booth there um, with so many wonderful things to look at and to learn about. And I'm really grateful to the whole team for pulling this together and honoring Indigenous Peoples Day in this manner. And a huge shout out to Indigenous Now for all the organizing that was done to make the event a, another um, a success this year. So thanks so much. Um, Director Avila. 
Nothing to report. Okay. Director Chandra Geary. Well, thank you. Nothing to report. Okay. Um, Director Hyatt. Yeah, was real short. I attended my first uh, student investment account meeting last month. I'm afraid I might miss this month. Um, anyway, it was pretty interesting. That's it. Great. All right. Anything else for the good of the order? Okay, I will adjourn the meeting at 8.48 p.m.